All right. So now we are. I'm going to talk about the spread of Buddhism along the Silk Road. I think some of you do know that I organize trips along the Silk Road, and there are three of such trips, three different trips, and uh, this will actually tell you about the Buddhist heritage as, as it passes through the Silk Road, which is really very interesting. Okay. Now we know that the Silk Road is a thoroughfare for the exchange of ideas, for knowledge, for technology, for culture, and precious goods. Precious goods goes in different directions, from China, from India, from the Middle East, and the Mediterranean. You could imagine that these are these four great um, cultures, centers of cultures, and they use the Silk Road as a conduit for, for, for trade. Of course, about the most precious thing, in China with silk, uh, because silk is very light to carry, and sometimes it's used as currency. You pay soldiers in bundles of silk, can you imagine? <laughs> because then with the silk, you can go to the market and buy some other things. Yeah? And uh, so this was also the conduit for Buddhism to be brought to China by Central Asian masters. Now, the silk route derives its name because of the lucrative trade of Chinese silk. It stretches over some of the most inhospitable terrain that you can imagine. For those of you who traveled with me, we could see sometimes you'd be traveling through deserts. We travel through the Gobi Desert, to the Taklamakan Desert. Taklamakan is a Uyghur word. Eh? It means actually the desert of no return. It's a desert that you can go in, but you won't come out because it's dry. Uh, you can only follow the river. And because of the dryness, if you do get water for a few days, you just perish. And the way you travel in the desert, sometimes you can see piles of bones. And those are animals and people who have passed away. But in our journey, we will cross the Taklamakan Desert. <laughs> because now there's a good highway. So can you imagine, on one end is China. You have to pass through the uh, Taklamakan Desert. Can you see down there? Mountains through Central Asia, and then into Persia to the Mediterranean. Of course, it, there are also routes to Afghanistan, to Pakistan, and India. You can see it's almost like stretching halfway around the world. That is a true route. Eh? Now, about the transmission of Buddhism, Buddhism started in India in the 5th century, before the Common Era. But um, after that, it spread rapidly to influence world cultures along the network of trading routes through Asia. Uh, this is known as the Silk Road. Between the first century uh, before uh, the Common Era and the seventh century Common Era, different strands of Buddhism travel across the Silk Road from India along the different routes to uh, Central Asia and China. Now, after the Buddha passed away at the age of 80, the monks decided to gather together to collect the teachings. This occurred about three months after the Buddha passed away. Actually, the reason for this was one monk, but then he was so bothered. He was not such a good monk, I think. When the Buddha passed away, he said, Oh, good, now we don't have a teacher to tell us what we can do and what we cannot do. Just after the Buddha passed away. So the monks who heard him got horrified and they said, Oh, my goodness, how could this Subhadra say something like that? So let us get together and need to collect the teachings. And 500 monks got together in the city of Rajagaha uh, under the sponsorship of um, uh, uh, the king yeah, of Rajagaha and they collected uh, the, the sutras and the Vinaya. Ananda, who has a phenomenal memory, recited the Sutta Pitaka and Upali, who, whose career was actually a barber, but he was ordained with the second princess. But he happens to be an expert on law, on legal matters. Eh? So he was he uh, was responsible for the Vinaya Pitaka. After that, about hundred years later, uh, there was already some problems again. Some monks they think that some of these rules that for the uh, Vinaya is a bit strict. You know, let us for the Patimoka, can we relax? Can we do away with this? So this happened in Vaishali, and then they decided to call the Second Buddhist Council because already there are some monks who are already raising. Issues. I think the problem was the Buddha said that some of the minor rules of the Patimoka can be done away with. But Ananda was so distressed to know that the Buddha was passing away that he didn't ask the Buddha what the minor rules were. So when he mentioned in the first council, the Buddha says, Oh, minor rules can do away with. The monk said, Good. Can you tell us what were the minor rules that the Buddha mentioned? And Ananda said, Oh my goodness, I forgot to ask them. That's <laughs> 
And of course, the presiding uh, chairman or the speaker, uh, Mahakashapa, he was very, he practices in the forest, you know. So he was a bit stern in the forest. And he said, if that kid, that's okay, let's practice for. Huh? And 100 years later, there was already this controversy. What are the uh, minor rules? And so they decided to call the Second Buddhist Council. This happens in Vaishali. And a schism already happened in, in the Sangha. There is one group of monks, they call Astaviravada, which actually led to Theravada. These are the elders. Huh? They were the strict conservative monks. And the Mahasangikas, the one who are not so strict, but who is more for the common people. Right? So already, two groups already, a schism has occurred in the Sangha. Third Buddhist Council, this was held in Pataliputra under the patronage of Ashoka. This is about 200 years after the Buddha passed away. They had the Third Buddhist Council. And Asoka played an important role in the dissemination of Buddhism throughout uh, Asia. Fourth Buddhist Council was held in Kashmir under the Kushan King Kanishka. We'll hear about him. And down here, it's clear that the council is already divided into sects. You have the Mahayana and uh, what the Mahayana calls Hinayana. But sometimes we use the term early Buddhism because Hinayana is not such a good word. Uh, early Buddhism. Okay, now let us talk about Ashoka. Ashoka appeared 200 years after the Buddha. Now, he was the first powerful monarch to embrace Buddhism. He was born in 304 before Common Era and rose to the throne in 270 after a short power struggle. He's got many brothers, you know, but very, he's very uh, unscrupulous. He eliminated all the brothers. Apparently, he got like 90 brothers, invited them for a dinner, a banquet, to have music and all that. Then the doors are closed and the archers appears in the window and started shooting all of them. So eliminated all his brothers. So he became emperor, you know. So actually, it's not good to be born in a royal family. Only one can be king. The rest, you got a high chance of being killed by your brothers. <laughs> and then he started expanding the empire uh, that he, he inherited from his grandpa, Chandragupta. And uh, he decided, wanted to conquer south of India because south of India is still not the Mauryan Empire. He fought a big battle at Kalinga. It is this they call Orissa. And after that, so many people died, hundreds of thousands of people died, and there was so much suffering. And for the first time, it's as if his eyes opened. He suddenly realized that the wars that he had brought so much suffering. It is almost like the wisdom eyes had to open. He suddenly realized, oh my goodness, you know, just because of my lust for power, see the kind of suffering that I brought to the people. And he wept in sight, and he was in deep remorse. And at that time, apparently, he met a monk who was, I think, like nine years old. And that monk actually happened to be his own nephew without him knowing. Uh, because amongst the brothers, only one of the brothers' wives managed to escape because she was pregnant. They didn't kill her. And she gave birth to the baby, and the baby later on became a young monk to convert Ashoka into a Buddhist. <laughs> because the moment he came to the throne room, this young monk went to the throne and sat on the throne. And Ashoka, you know, he was filled with remorse, but that is a symbol that Dharma is taking over the throne. And after that, he became a Buddhist, changed everything. He sent Buddhist missionaries to Sri Lanka, to Southeast Asia, even to Greece, to Egypt, to Syria, to Macedonia. And also he had a son by the name Mahinda, whom he sent to Sri Lanka, all right, and established uh, Sri Lankan uh, uh, Theravada Buddhism. And from Sri Lanka, it actually went over to Myanmar, to uh, to Thailand, Cambodia, and all that. So very important. Eh? This is empire. It's a very big empire. Can you see Magadha? Uh, that is the kingdom. And uh, the part of the map shaded uh, in light color, cover, covering even Pakistan, Gandhara, Takshila, up to the north. Um, that is the extent of his empire. The southern part of India is not part of his empire. Now, there are two strands. The Staviravada school of Buddhism went to Sri Lanka, and that is what we call Theravada, yeah. early Buddhism. Another one is called Savastivada. This is a group that is almost like kind of break away from the early Buddhism. It went up north and went up to Kashmir, and that later influenced the development of Mahayana Buddhism. Okay. So, um, Savastivada, which is a non-Mahayana school, went northeast 
and northwest of in, uh, when northeast and northwest of India, where it remained for another ten centuries. Uh, this is if you go to Sanchi, you will see the stupa that is built by Ashoka. It's a beautiful um, stupa, and there's a map of the stupa. Uh, the Sanchi is the place where Mahinda comes from, because Ashoka, when he was a young general, fell in love this, with this young woman, and uh, from her got uh, a son and a daughter. And then when he became emperor, never came back to see her again. But that son became Mahinda, Araha Mahinda, who brought the Buddhism to Sri Lanka. Very interesting. And the daughter brought the Bodhi tree uh, to plant at Anuradhapura. That's the oldest recorded Bodhi tree, uh, uh, oldest recorded tree in the world. All right, there was Ashoka. While this was happening, in 138 BC, there was a person by the name of uh, Tang Tian, um, you know, who the, um, the China at that time was having a lot of problems with the nomadic tribes from the north, from Mongolia. They're called the Xiongnu. And they used to attack China, and the Chinese were helpless because these are horsemen, very powerful. And the moment they attacked, the Chinese were just defenseless. They were like farmers. How could you fight against the Xiongnu? But there is another group which is called the Yuachi, which is also nomadic. Now, that China wanted to get help from the Yuachi in order to defend themselves against the Xiongnu. So he got a volunteer, the emperor got a volunteer, his name is uh, Tang Tian, in 138, he set out from Chang'an, or Xi'an present day, with 100 soldiers moving to the west. He wanted to see the Yuachi tribe, but unfortunately, to reach the Yuachi tribe, you have to pass the Xiongnu nomadic tribe, and he was caught. But apparently he was a good uh, diplomat, so he was not killed. So he lived with the Xiongnu for 10 years, and also got a wife, and got a son. <laughs> and after that, he managed to escape and uh, move on some more to Seong Liu and found that they have actually moved much further. Yeah, all right? Could not get them. And um, the Yuachi has moved further west, but he found that there are some pros prosperous countries. You know, after passing through the desert area, you come to prosperous countries with jade and agricultural products. Actually, this is Fergana Valley, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, where the agriculture products are grapes and wine, which the Chinese don't have. And the most important of all, they have got the powerful horses, the thousand Li horses, the horse that, uh, uh, bled, that, that, that sweat blood, right? Uh, so they fell in love. He fell in love with the horses because China, they don't have the kind of horse to defend against Xiongnu. So he came back and had to pass through the Xiongnu territory and was caught again for three years, and then he managed to escape again <laughs> went back to China and reported to the emperor. So emperor wanted these heavenly horses, and they, they fought two wars in order to get access to the horse. Huh? And this is a horse from Fergana Valley uh, that, that uh, you go in the second silk road. Huh? Uh, Fergana Valley, very rich in agriculture products and all that. All right? So the Han rulers uh, got the horses, and after that, they interbreed, and the horses could actually now defend. They use for military purposes. It's like having tanks, right? When you fight a battle, you need tanks. The horses are like tanks. These are the horses that can run, very powerful. As compared to the Chinese horses, Chinese horses cannot. Apparently, they don't have selenium, a lot of selenium in the grass, so the horses are not so strong. So you must get the horses from Fergana Valley. All right. So this is how the Silk Road looks like. If you begin from Rome, uh, remember it's the Roman Empire at that time. They travel across the Mediterranean, go to Alexandria, that is Egypt, go to the Red Sea, and then sail all the way to India. Right? And from India, you go up the Indus River, go to Gandhara, Bamiyan, that's Afghanistan, and then, on, then you move uh, eastwards uh, towards Central Asia um, through uh, the Silk Road into China. So that is the route of the Silk Road. All right? So the region of the Gandhara controlled the passes into Afghanistan. These are all mountainous areas it's covered with ice. And there are only certain passage that you can use. This is called a mountain pass. Your way in order to travel from, from India, from Pakistan, into Central Asia. And so this is the Central Asian Silk Road. By 50 BC, the sea, uh, tree, ocean trade routes connecting Rome with India uh, was open, and it was linked to the other routes in Central Asia leading to China. So Zhang Tian, started from China and moved to Central Asia to discover the Silk Road. And, and at the same time, from Rome itself, they managed to sail all the way to India. And from India, they can move up 
uh, to Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, and then you can actually interlink. Uh. So can you see halfway around the world? It's fantastic, right? So how many zeros are there? Actually, there's not one zero, there are many zeros. And although the word is Silk Road, you may think the road is very smooth, nothing like that. <laughs> you stand in the middle, it's desert. Any direction you see, there's no road. And sometimes you pass through um, mountain passes. It's actually very dangerous. Huh? Mountain passes and snowy glaciers, <laughs> and deserts that people don't survive. Huh? Uh, so these are all the, the roads that you can take. Now, at the same time, what is really happening, just after the Buddha passed away, before Ashoka, in between the Buddha and Ashoka, was Alexander the Great. <laughs> Alexander the Great started in Macedonia. He decided as a young man, started becoming a general, and started conquering all these areas. And he was a master strategist, uh, and he managed to get, expand his empire, conquered uh, Egypt and all that, and then the conquered Persia, which is the biggest empire in the world at that time. And the, after he conquered Persia, after Persia fell, King Darius, um, after fighting three battles with him, lost. King Darius started escaping, running towards the east of his empire. And Alexander the Great wanted to meet King, King Darius. He doesn't want to kill him, just wanted to meet, but Darius was scared. So he started running with his, with his uh, generals. And as he started running to Central Asia, with the extent of his territory, and uh, that actually lured uh, Alexander the Great to follow because he wanted to catch uh, Darius, wanted to meet him. And Alexander was actually very kind to the whole Darius family, you know, look after the family, never kill them. <laughs> he was, and he also admired the Persian culture, and he got his soldiers to marry Persian women also. <laughs> so he likes the Persians quite a lot. So as he went into uh, Central Asia, eventually they found that Darius was murdered by his own general. And Alexander was so disappointed. He had a royal burial for, for Darius. And that brought him actually into Central Asia, into like Samarkand, you know, the capital of trading, into uh, Uzbekistan, where he remained actually for some time because those people were fierce fighters. They were like guerrilla fighters. They were fighting against, against the Greek soldiers. And from there, you see Bactria, Bactria is already Afghanistan. From then onwards, Alexander crossed the river, which you call Amudaya River or Oxus River, and went into Afghanistan where you have Bactria. And then went to Gandhara, and then they, they started fighting war with, the, uh, with, with India, uh, North India. And of course, then he returned back uh, to Babylon. He died in Babylon. Now, what happened? Why are we interested in Alexander's empire? Because this brought about the development of what we call Greco Buddhism in Central Asia. Greek Buddhist. Greek became Buddhist because of Alexander Great. You see, after he started conquering these this, this wars, when he was in Persia, he saw that the moment after a city fell, the soldiers would just take whatever they want. And they know that the Persian Empire was very, very rich. The treasury was rich at Persepolis. So the moment when the, the Persians started falling, Alexander took up a team and advanced him and started racing to Persepolis in order to what you call choke <laughs> uh, the treasury. So nobody can steal treasury. So he became wealthy, he became a billionaire. Alexander the Great became a billionaire and that helped him to fund the other expeditions. So when some of the soldiers who were fighting with him for so many years, they say, Alexander, we are actually tired of fighting. You want to go some more, you want to conquer the world, go on. But we want to stay here because this place is nice. This is around Gandhara, where in the valleys is you know, you've got uh, good agriculture, you know, people, the soldiers are quite happy there. They say, we want to settle here. So Alexander gave them a big pension, gave them land and all that, and so they settled there. And then that became, later on they became Buddhists. These are the Greek Buddhists, Greco Buddhists, all right? Now, Greco Buddhism. So Alexander conquered Persia, 331 BC, and proceeded to Central Asia. Some of his enemy, uh, some of his army chose to settle in Central Asia and they become descendants of early Buddhists. Uh, this is Greek plus Buddhism, right? So that's called a syncretism, cultural syncretism. Hellenistic uh, culture, which is Greek and Buddhism, occurred for 800 years in Central Asia. So for 800 years, there was this mingling of Greek philosophy and all that together with uh, Buddhism, right? It is a fourth century BC to the fifth century AD. And it was the Greek Buddhists that developed the sculptures of Buddha, 
and influence the development of Buddhism, particularly Mahayana Buddhism. And Buddhism prospered under the Indo Greek kings. And uh, these uh, Greek, actually, Greek monks, later on when Ashoka came, it was the Greek monks who also brought the teachings into, into Europe, the Greek monks. You never think that Greeks are monks, <laughs> Buddhist monks, <laughs> spreading Buddhism. Very interesting. <laughs> and then after uh, Ashoka, you have this king, Melinda, or Menander number one. He had a dialogue with a monk called Nagashena. King Melinda will ask questions that eventually you cannot answer because his questions are very, very sharp. He questions about the doctrine about Buddhism. Many monks gave up, could not answer him, but he met his match by the monk, young monk by the name of Nagasena. Nagasena was able to explain things so clearly to the king. They had the dialogue for three days, having this kind of engagement. And after three days, King Melinda decided to become a Buddhist. And the record of his dialogue is in this book called The Questions of King Melinda. This is part of the Pali Canon. Yeah. And uh, King Melinda is, uh, is a historical figure, and that is a coin that they use. Yeah. And a picture of him having a dialogue three days with this monk. And eventually, all the questions he had about Buddhism was answered by this monk very skillfully, yeah? like Nagasena. OK. Then after this, um, you would have uh, what we call um, the Kushan Empire. Kushan Empire is based in Gandhara. Can you see the word Gandhara there? Mm -hmm. Gandhara, that is, that Gandhara is in Pakistan. Huh? Uh, there was an expansion of the Gandhara Empire to the Tarim Basin. Tarim Basin is in Central Asia. Uh, you can see the loop where the word Central Asia, that is the Tarim Basin. It is like a bowl. And in the center is Taklamakan Desert. Yeah? It's like a basin. And uh, so when the Kushan Empire expanded to the Tarim Basin, it gave security and safety and protection to the traders. So this is how the whole, the oasis cities along the Syrup flourished. Apparently, a young maiden with lots of gold could travel alone along the Syrup and will not get harassed. You know, there was the amount of safety during the Kushan Empire. It was a good time to travel, right? There was safety. So because of the control of the passes, financed flourishing Buddhist communities, and therefore you have this Greek culture flowing into Central Asia. Uh, you could see the Bodhisattva, the Gandhara picture. Uh, okay, now let us go to, to Kanishka. Kanishka was the other great king after Ashoka, all right? He was the emperor of the Kushan uh, Empire, and this was based, can you see the word Kushan? That is based in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. And um, his empire stretched uh, from Bactria, which is even Uzbekistan. He goes up to Uzbekistan, to Tajikistan, to Afghanistan, to Pakistan, and then right into India, the northern part of India. That was the extent of his empire. Because of his patronage of Buddhism, it helped to develop the Silk Road and the transmission of Mahayana Buddhism from Gandhara to China. Because of the peace, now people from Central Asia could actually travel all the way along the Silk Road and bring Buddhism to China. This was the time of uh, Kanishka. And he came up with the first sculptures. They are Greeks. The Greeks want to see the Buddha in a human form. Before that, the Buddha was represented by the footprint. <laughs> footprint of the Buddha, or maybe uh, you know, uh, a kind of a throne, you know? Uh, this is how they represent the Buddha, but the Greeks want to see Buddha in a human face. So they were the first sculptures of the Buddha. So the first sculptures appeared in Gandhara, and can you see how beautiful they are? Huh? This was done in Gandhara. Okay, and uh, amongst, uh, let us now go westwards. Uh, this was a place that we went. Can you see the word Termis? You might not see it. the one with the circle, the yellow. That is the, uh, in very south Uzbekistan just near the Amudaya River. If you cross the river, you will go into Afghanistan. So we actually went there. That was the extent of Buddhism because uh, they did some excavations and there were monasteries, Buddhist monasteries there. First, second century monasteries. They were just remnants there. They were excavated by the Russian archaeologists. And we went, there, we went there and did some puja also, which is quite interesting. So this is the evidence that um, uh, Buddhism ex was established uh, in about the first century AD, there were Buddhist monasteries near the place called Termis. This is current uh, Uzbekistan. Huh? We think of Uzbekistan as basically uh, Muslim, but uh, Buddhism was actually there. And there were Buddhist monasteries, and the monks were from the Theravada tradition. Mm. 
These are some things that we found in the museum. That was a picture of the monasteries that we went, but you only see the remnants there. They are stupa, it's still there, all right? This is a recreation. And then another statue of the Buddha, uh, which is in the museum at, at uh, Tashkan, which was excavated at, at Termis. Yeah? So we were actually there, Amudaya River, on the other side of really Afghanistan. Uh, if you travel further, that's called Bactria, also center of Buddhism, or Balkh. All right, now let us go to some of these major cities. Uh, in our travels, we do not go to this part now because this is like Afghanistan and Pakistan. <laughs> they don't go yet. But let us look at Gandhara, okay? Uh, Gandhara is on the, these the communities of uh, um, Gandhara, of Hada, this um, of the Kushan Empire, was interlinked with Central Asia because of uh, the Silk Roads. Huh? Uh, but you have to pass through many mountains. The Himalayans, the Karakora Mountain, the Pamir Mountain, the Kundun Mountain, the Tenshan Mountains. So it actually goes as an up on there. It's almost impermanent penetrable. Just mountains going up to the sky. And how are you going to cross on to, over to the other side? Huh? But there are mountain passes, only two for the Silk Road. One is uh, through the Swat, uh, Swat Valley, the other one is a bit north. That's how you link up. Okay, now let us look at Gandhara. Uh, Buddhism and trade. Here in Gandhara, you've got lush valleys where the Himalayans meet the foothills of the Indian Kush. So there was a great sculptural tradition that existed from the 2nd century BC to 6th century AD. And Buddhism was flourishing here uh, in Pakistan, Gandhara. And from here, it started spreading uh, eastwards. And uh, this is an image of the Sending Buddha, Gandhara, in Pakistan. Third to fourth century, right? Very nice. Bodhisattva, Gandhara. You see, the, uh, almost Greek in nature, Bodhisattva. And Hada, Hada is in the Afghanistan. Beautiful Buddhist sculptures there, but I think now completely destroyed because of the issues in Afghanistan. They destroyed all the statues. So this is an a picture that you will see, uh, one of the pictures that was saved in the museum. So the communities of North India came into contact uh, with uh, Kashmir, Gandhara, Swat Valley, Afghanistan. Okay, Gandhara monks and travelers will travel to Afghanistan uh, through the low passes and skirt the high Himalayas. And then down here, can you see Kashgar, Kazil, and Tufan? This is the what you call the Northern Silk Road. All right. In our journeys, we went down to Tufan, we went to Kizil, and we went to Kashgar as well. <laughs> All right. And then there's also another one, going through the Swat Valley, and this is the Southern Sea Road. You go to Khotan. Yeah? In Bamiyan, uh, this is a central Afghanistan, a monastery community grew around Bamiyan, and they were really influential. By the second century AD, this was the hub of trade and cultural exchange with the Greeks, the Turks, Persians, Indians, and Chinese. And by the fifth century, you know, there were three famous Buddha statues carved on the clay face. The tallest was 175 feet tall, the tallest standing statue of the Buddha, uh, until it was destroyed by the Taliban. This is a recreation of how the statue would look like. It's a 3D light projection done by the Taiwanese 14 years after it was blasted off in 2001. So this was how it would have looked like on the face of a mountain, 175 feet tall, as you enter into the valley, you know. So the people were actually Buddhists, and there was a shorter Buddha image which was also destroyed. Uh, now, at that time, the Afghans also forgot that this, because the face was all broken. They tried to tear this statue down many times in the past, cut off the hand, cut off the leg, but this is a mountain. Eventually, the Taliban had, all, had the ammunition to blast up the whole Buddha. So there was a big Buddha and there was a smaller Buddha. Both was blasted off. Yeah. There was another one, apparently a reclining Buddha. I think the, they didn't find it. From Gandhara, the sea road winds through the icy peaks and glaciers of the Karakora Mountains. Okay, now let us now move eastwards. Huh? Uh, can you see the Karakoram Pass? The yellow circle. The yellow circle, that is, that is a winding road through the mountain pass. Uh, in order to come up to the Sea Road. 
And you know, the China has now done the Karakoram Highway. We travel on the highway. It was fantastic. It's all on pillars and just fly across. A, and that's the most, one of the most scenic places that you ever saw. The mountains, the snow mountains, they didn't really know how to plan the highway. Because as you go for about 40 minutes, you just see the snow mountains just on your sides. Beautiful. All right. Like this. That's how the Karakoram looks like. It's a huge mountain range spanning the borders of Pakistan, India, and China, Afghanistan, Tajikistan. The second highest mountain, which is K2, is also found here, Karakoram. And it is the most number of glaciers outside the polar region. So, you know, if you are a traveler, traveling along the Silk Road, you will have to pass through mountains like that. <laughs> Many don't survive. <laughs> Many died along the way. The eyes and the high elevation and food. Uh, this is the Karakoram Highway, for instance. You travel Karakoram, you see mountains like this. Huh? This is from Xinjiang linking to Pakistan. Very scenic uh, mountain road. We were not able to travel to Pakistan. Uh, there is a border pass because of security reasons, but we went halfway and turned around. Yeah. But, but the site was fantastic. And this is one of the pictures. This is at the uh, stone fortress at Tashkugan, up on the Karakora Mountains. And this was a fortress in order to guard the mountain pass, and they also collect tolls. So if you are traveling in a, in a caravan, means that there are maybe like 25 people. So you need some, some strong people who can fight. <laughs> because you're being attacked by the marauding uh, uh, tribes, you know. Uh, if they see that the caravan is not strong, they just attack, they kill the people, take the goods and enjoy, right? That's what they do, those, those people. So you need to protect yourself, but you must not be too big. So you have to bring some camels, because camels can actually walk in the mountain passes, and they are very, uh, camels are really good animals, right? And then horses and some mules, and then you'll be taxed on every item that you bring, how many people you have, how many animals you have. So this uh, uh, passes, uh, uh, becomes very rich, uh, just like tolls. Uh. <laughs> so this is, this is one of the uh, fortresses that, that, that we went to. They are also trying to recreate that. Uh, very uh, scenic up on the uh, Karakoram Pass. This is the third zero. All right. And then now uh, the, in the lower part of the zero, you can go to the kingdom of Khotan. Khotan is an ancient Iranian Saka Buddhist kingdom. So they were Iranian Buddhists as well. The southern edge of the Taklamakan Desert of the Tarim Basin. And uh, they found some remnants down there. This Khotan itself was a very, uh, very strong uh, Buddhist center. This is, for instance, the Gorai Chana Buddha painting that was found in Khotan. This is the center of trade and famous for the high quality jade. Apparently, they got two rivers. One is a white jade, one is a black jade. So when it is dry season, when the water in the river goes down, you can walk on the riverbank and look out for your own pieces of jade. And sometimes they come in big blocks of stone, and the jade could actually be down there, but you need to have a good eye. So when the water is down, you'll find the schools also no teachers. <laughs> Everybody go to the, to the river in order to pick up the, the jade, because the jade comes from the mountain. And this high quality jade finds a way all the way to China. Huh? Jade from Khotan. And they also have silk, because one day the king of Khotan married a Chinese princess, and she smuggled silk worms in her hair. Because it's a crime. If you are caught bringing silk out of China, not only will you be killed, but all your relatives and all that, they kill, kill, kill everybody. So it was protected national treasure. But because as a princess, she's so used to silk, she could not live without silk. So she managed to smuggle the silk worms into her hair with some mulberry leaf and go brown to Khotan. And that's how Khotan started the silk, <laughs> silk industry. Okay? So this um, Fasian and Xuanzang, when they passed through Khotan in the 4th to the 7th century, they confirmed that Khotan was a leading Mahayana Buddhist. Southern Silk Road was Mahayana Buddhism, Northern Silk Road Theravada Buddhism. And they had tens of thousands of Buddhist monks. Even the king and subject were pious Buddhists. Apparently, they have one ceremony a year where they have the big Buddha statue. And the king himself will go down in, you know, on the streets. And he give up everything that he have. And the, um, the public will buy and then donate back to the king. <laughs> Very strange. <laughs> Very strange. Eh? <laughs> Giving away. Khotan remained a Buddhist kingdom for 1,000 years until it was conquered by the Turks. 
and then the whole city became Muslim. You know? So you go down there, you don't have much. These are the remnants that they managed to get from Khotan. Okay, now let us go up to the northern part of the Syria. This place called Kocha, in northern Syria. And for a long time, it was the most populous oasis in the Tarim uh, uh, Basin. And famous for agriculture, they got very, very good fruits uh, because of very fertile. The water comes from the glaciers, right? And also famous for music and dances. And the people are lovely looking, good looking. And this is before the Turks came. When Sun Chang Wang down went there, they were the original inhabitants of Kucha. They were all good looking. The men and women are all good looking. And they dance and their music, they're famous for their music. Hmm? So the early Buddhism, Savastivada, was prevalent amongst the oasis. And they have a famous cave called Kizil Caves, where we also went, where they have murals besides Tung Huang. Kizil Caves also have. Huh? I'll show you some pictures. Okay. We went to this place called Subashi Kujang, that means all the ancient city of Kucha. This is probably the place where Sun Chang visited. This is like a capital, and there are also stupas there. Stupas, remnants, uh, things left in the desert. Uh, this is a, a monastery complex. Okay? That is in Kucha, uh, northern Syria. And also, uh, you have uh, the Kizil Caves, where this is the uh, image of uh, Kamara, Kumarajiwa. Fourth century, he was really famous because he was the one who translated uh, Sanskrit scriptures into Chinese. He was a prodigy. At the age of seven itself, he can look at the sutra one time, two times, close. He can raise up from the start to the end. That is his memory. Then he followed his mother, who became a nun, went to Kashmir to learn up Sanskrit and all that. By the time he was 12 or 13 years old, he can take anybody on debate on Buddhism. Can you imagine if you were a very well-learned monk, in your 30s and 40s, and you saw this 12-year-old boy for a debate, and you think, wow, 12-year-old boy. Suddenly, when he started quoting this and that and that, you give up. <laughs> because this young boy is a prodigy. <laughs> and uh, he learned Chinese because he was kept in a prison for uh, 17 years, I think. That's how he picked up Chinese, in a prison. And later on, when he went to China, he led translation teams. And that's why, in the case of the Mahayana school, some of the best translations are done by uh, led by Kumarajiwa. Okay, so can you see the caves at the back? We go to the Kazil caves, and these are some paintings that you see. These are the murals that cover ten thousand square meters, and they are praised as Buddhist treasures. They are only second to Tung uh, This is this picture is taken by iPhone, by the way. So it's something you don't need <laughs> good cameras because you cannot bring camera. So iPhone also okay. Luckily they allow. <laughs> mm. Okay. Now let us move eastwards to Tufan. Tufan is actually in a depression. It's the Sokka's second lowest depression uh, after the Dead Sea. Dead Sea is the lowest depression. Eh? Tufan is second lowest. And it's a fertile oasis because it's fed by underwater, underground water channels. They call it uh, the Keras water channels. They tap it from the melting snows from the glaciers. It goes underground under these water channels that stretches for many kilometers. And the whole city is a uh, brought on this water, and the water tastes really good. It's like one of those filtered water, very, very good tasting water. And because of that, they grow the grapes. They got many, many variety of grapes that you cannot imagine. So the grapes and all that, and, but place is so hot. Too fun, it's really hot. <laughs> the original inhabitants was Indo-European, and later on they became, came under Chinese influence under uh, 100 BC. Uh, let's go to Too fun. At Tufan, there is this famous old city called uh, uh, Kaojang, old city at Tufan, Xinjiang. At the back, can you see the mountains? Uh, sometimes with the sunset, and especially in summer, that's called the flaming mountains. Because it becomes so hot, the surface of the mountain will rise up to 60, 70, 70 degrees centigrade. You put on your shoes, your shoes will melt. And it's not possible to climb up the mountain during summer, you'll just die. Dehydration, you just this. So uh, in the monkey story, uh, the monkey god used a fan to fan. Uh, that's the Fleming Mountain. On the foreground is this uh, remnants of an old city, Gaojiang. Okay, and this is where at one time there was a king by the name of Chi Wen Tai, who heard that Sun Chang was traveling, and Sun Chang has a, wanted to go in one way, but he go and meet Sun Chang with his whole delegation and brought Sun Chang to Gaojiang. 
And after hearing the Dhamma talks from Sen Zhang, he fell in love with Sen Zhang. He said, I want you as my Dhamma master. We are a Buddhist kingdom. We don't have a master like you. And prevented Sen Zhang from moving on, you know. Sen Zhang wanted to go to Nalanda, and there was this king who blocked his entry. So he threatened Sen Zhang. He said, if you don't stay here, I'm I'm going to bring, imprison you by force or send you back to China because you escaped from China. You went out of China against the emperor's wishes, and you're going to be killed. Sun Chang said, Emperor, there's no problem. You can keep my body, you can control my body, but you cannot control my mind. And Sun Chang went three days fasting, you know, and it was hot summer. Sun Chang was like fasting. And every day the green king brought food to him. Sun Chang doesn't want to eat the food. First day, second day, third day. Then he saw Sun Chang fading and he got scared and started having pity, you know, for one. There was this monk who was so determined. He was only 20 years old. He was so determined to go to India. So the king also gave up. He said, okay, lah, Sun Chang, I take you as my brother now. <laughs> I will sponsor you. I will support you. And he gave Sun Chang a lot of things, horses and people and silver and silk and all that for Sun Chang to give because he will be going to many kingdoms he can give as presents. So it was the Chi Wen Tai who supported Sun Chang along his journey. So this was his city. Unfortunately, after Sun Chang left and all that, because he sided with the Turks on the west, the Tang attacked, attacked Kao Zhang. And when the Tang started coming with the army, he died at a heart, at a heart attack. I think he never looked after his heart very well. Maybe eat too much, <laughs> lots of cholesterol. <laughs> Got a heart attack and he died. <laughs> too bad. <laughs> yeah. City of Kao Zhang. <laughs> okay, beside Kao Zhang is this basic, basically a thousand Buddha caves, too fun. This was discovered, there were paintings, grottoes, huh? and um, some of these paintings, huh? we went there, many of them were cut, cut out murals. The nicer pieces were actually cut out because what they did was that uh, these are stone caves, uh, they used uh, straw to uh, plaster it, and then on top of it they put some kind of a line and they painted on that. So when the German Lacoff came here in uh, 1890, he discovered this cave with all these paintings. He managed to cut out this part, this beautiful uh, orb, uh, murals and cut them back to Germany. So some of these things I actually found in Germany. Uh, the ones that remain were destroyed like during the Cultural Revolution and all that. Huh? And of course this entire area is no longer Buddhist. So this is some of, some of the beautiful paintings. Oh, Chunghuang. I do not know why the color is like this. I need to go back and reduce, I think, uh, transparency. Can you see tomorrow? <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? Uh, that part better. Actually, it is better, but I think I put uh, the adjustment of the transparency. Okay? We go to Tung Huang. Okay, Tung Huang is famous for their uh, sand dunes. The sand dunes rise like many stories high, yeah? and you can walk on the sand dunes. <laughs> it's very nice. And of course, they've got camels. When you have sand dunes, you need camels. Since the ancient time, Tung Huang was a major trade center between China and the Western neighbors. You know, the Silk Road, you have the Northern Silk Road and Southern Silk Road, and they meet around Tung Huang. And from there, you move to the Gangzhou, uh, Hersi Corridor, and Gangzhou, and then you go to Xi'an. So, this is the meeting point of the two Silk Roads. So, it becomes really wealthy, and the uh, Chinese also had a kind of a post, military post down there. All right? So, trade was flourishing. And because when the Silk Road was used uh, until 1400s, after the breakup of the Mongol uh, Empire, it is no longer safe to use Silk Road. So the whole Silk Road is no longer under use. But when it was flourishing, Tung Huang was very rich and it was Buddhist. So the residents sponsored the paintings in the, in, of caves. They got about 700 caves, about 490 of them had paintings, Buddha images, paintings, and all that. So they were rich to sponsor. So you have your own cave sponsored by your own family. If you like, you can even have your face painted by the artist <laughs> in the caves. This is called the Mokau Caves. Tong Huang. The first picture you see is the main entrance, shrine hall, where you got a big Buddha image. Uh, these are some images that you see in Tong Huang. These caves were used for meditations. They also became shrines and galleries in the desert. There's 45,000 square meters of paintings and sculptures, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Buddhist stories. If you put them side by side, they will stretch for 30 kilometers. So Macau, 
uh, Mokau is the uh, peerless caves. It's peerless actually in the Buddhist history. Uh, good thing that it was in the desert, so the paintings were preserved. And it was hidden because it was completely forgotten, so it was not destroyed. Only discovered only in the 1800s eh? by the British. Ah. All right, so. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, there were Buddhism among the nomadic people of the steppes. The nomadic people were very fierce fighters. Uh, they, um, even as a little child, you learn how, how to ride horses. By the time you're six years old, you can race horses. You know, the nomads, they have racing where the riders start from the age of six to the age of 12. They ride on horses without saddles and they have race to see which horse can run fastest. Six years old. So these are the people who are used to horses. They can sleep on horses. They can shoot arrows on horses. So you can imagine they were very fierce. And when they attack, if they gang up and attack, just um, the whole cities can fall, right? But when Buddhism went to them, for instance, you got the Turks. They're called the Toba Turks. They uh, they were very fierce. But when they became Buddhist, they've softened. They become more cultured. <laughs> And later on, they become what you call the Northern Wei Dynasty. They also became more Chinese. They absorbed the Chinese culture. So Buddhism has turned people who are just so rough into very civilized people. Uyghur Turks. These days, we say Uyghur as Muslims, right? There are some issues in Xinjiang. But actually, for about 300 years or so, they were, some of them were Buddhists also. This, they, were, they, came, they were driven out of Mongolia by also the, uh, the Xiongnu. And they settled near the Tarim Oasis near Tufan, where we just saw Tufan, around 850. And uh, some of them were, were Buddhists, and some of the beautiful paintings were actually painted by the Uyghurs. And uh, later on, uh, they converted to Islam in the 1600s. So that was actually quite late. So they were Buddhists, actually. Uh, there were also the Western Turks. Uh, they were a powerful force until the mid-70s, and they established Buddhist sanctuaries at Kapisa and also in Afghanistan. So these are the Turks that were Buddhist, but because of the contact with Buddhism, they became very cultured, uh, became civilized, and become very compassionate. <laughs> Change, eh? Change the whole tribe. Ah, so we know that the Buddhism was actually practicing down there, prevalent, but Buddhism eventually passed away. It disappeared from Central Asia. In the Western part of Central Asia, Buddhism practically disappeared by the end of the 1000 AD or so. It was like 950 in Khotan, where the king himself was such a devout Buddhist. whole city was Buddhist. Uh, the whole city fell to the attacks by the Turks. And uh, it became Islam. And eventually, everybody became Muslim. So some of the monks had to run because they were linked up with this highway. They, 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 they settle actually in Tibet and, you know, uh, they go to other, uh, the other parts. The northern route of the Silk Road survived for a few more centuries, but by the end of the 15th century, it disappeared. So now, if you go over to the Oasis, they're no longer Buddhists, they're Muslims, Muslim community. So Buddhism disappeared from Central Asia. But Buddhism, Central Asian Buddhists have a very important thing because from Central Asia, it brought Buddhism to China. So whereas it disappeared from Central Asia, in China they continued to prosper. Huh? Uh, Buddhism entered to China in the 1st to 2nd century AD as a result of the uh, Kushan Empire. We talk about Kanishka and Kushan, right? So it was during that time that Buddhism went over to China. Monks from the Gandhara region played a pivotal role in the development and transmission of Buddhist ideas in the middle century. Actually, these monks were very, um, they're very devout and very um, fearless. Because for you to travel to the Silk Road all the way from Gandhara to, to China, you could also encounter the same problem as Xuan Chang did. You know, so they, um, first, second, third century, monks from Central Asia went to China. And then from fourth century onwards, Chinese monks started going the other way to India. So they were also using the Silk Road as well. Okay? And uh, the Central Asian and the Chinese monks maintain strong con connections for centuries that follow. So you have two monks, one is blue-eyed, one is Chinese. <laughs> blue-eyed, Central Asians. <laughs> so, 
some of the early translations of Buddhist scriptures into Chinese, like the second century, were done by Central Asian monks. Altogether, there's a record of 37 Central Asian monks, including An Chikao, uh, there's uh, 148 to 170, uh, Lokak Sima, uh, Kumarajiwa, Bodhidharma, this was all from Central Asia. Bodhidharma was actually from India. Mm. And uh, the Kushan monk, Lokachima, was the first translator of Mahayana Buddhist scriptures into Chinese. Yeah? And established the translation bureau at Luoyang. Luoyang was, uh, was one of the very important centers besides Xi'an. Yeah? Starting from the 4th century onwards, Chinese monks traveled the Silk Road through Central Asia to India to get access to the original scriptures. Because the translations by these Central Asian monks were not very good. Some of them cannot speak Chinese. So the translators were done by their disciples. They listened to the teacher saying something, and then they tried to translate. So, and they don't even have the terms in Chinese. Chinese don't have a term called uh, bodhi. They don't have it. You know? So sometimes they borrow from Sanskrit, and sometimes they take Taoist terms, you know, because you don't have an equivalent uh, term in Chinese to explain Buddhist ideas. So if you read uh, the Chinese scriptures, you get confused. And that is why. Monks like Xuan Zhang, who wants precision, he decided to go to China to get the original scriptures and do the translation himself. Because his translation is not good. People cannot understand Buddhism like this. Right? That's why he traveled all the way and risked his life to get the original scriptures. So starting from the 4th century, Chinese monks traveled the Silk Road through Central Asia to India to get access to the original ideas. Fa Xian was much earlier. It's 395 to 414. Xuan Chang is a uh, 7th century, 629 to 644. Uh, okay, so, uh, so uh, I think Fa Xian went by land and then returned by sea. Xuan Chang went by land, returned by land. Because he promised the king of Kaozhang that he will come back after he gets the scriptures to come back to Kaozhang again. But after traveling over land, he received the news that the king actually died. So instead of traveling along the Northern Sea Road, which is a much longer journey, he decided to travel the Southern Sea Road, which is more and more difficult actually, because Southern Sea Road, actually the, the whole uh, cities get dried up, and whole cities are gone because the rivers and the lakes all dry up, so the cities were abandoned. So Sun Chang actually took the Southern Sea Road on his way back to China. He went Northern Sea Road to India, come back to Southern Sea Road, all right? Um, by the time you come to Yiting, Already there was turbulence in uh, Silk Road. Silk Road can not safe to travel. So Yi Ching traveled by sea uh, to India and returned by sea. And he stopped by in Malaya and in Palembang and wrote a lot about Indonesia, Buddhism, how Buddhism was being practiced around this part of the world. Yi Ching, huh? He could not travel by land. No longer safe, Silk Road. So uh, spread of Buddhism in China first imported from India and Central Asia. In first century CE, uh, Buddhism in China evolved a hybrid of Chinese and foreign elements. So Chinese begin to have their own hybrid of Buddhism, yeah, and it became well established by 400 uh, 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 CE and remained up to the 21st century. From China, Buddhism spread to Korea, this fourth to sixth century, and from Korea it went to Japan, sixth century. And uh, Buddhism in China reached its peak during the Tang Dynasty, but after that there were persecutions in China. So Buddhism also, some schools in Buddhism completely disappeared. But those schools were transplanted to Japan. And so it remained being practiced in Japan, the schools that have actually disappeared in China, which is interesting. So Japan has actually the older form of um, uh, Buddhism in China. And the China, two parts. The northern part of China continued to get monks from the Silk Road, so they tend to be more Indian, the Indian schools. Southern, they were not linked up so much with the Silk Road, they developed their own form of Buddhism. For instance, uh, Zen Buddhism developed in southern China, Pure Land developed in southern China, there's the Chinese version of, of Buddhism. Okay. And the uh, important thing is Buddhism spread very peacefully. Uh, through the centuries, first to Southeast Asia, Central Asia, China, and the rest of Asia. Finally to Tibet, all right? And it developed in this region organically. They don't use violence, no bloodshed. Uh, it's being brought along by the traders. The monks travel with the traders, and communities of Buddhists started sprouting around, okay? And sometimes rulers adopted Buddhism to bring ethics to the people. 
and no one was forced to convert because Buddhism was higher culture. So sometimes the rulers want higher culture, like the five precepts for the people. So they brought in Buddhism. This is the map of the spread of Buddhism. It is not going to be my talk. There's a, if uh, there is another, if there is an opportunity for another talk, I can talk about this because I've written a chapter for a World Tourism Organization publication. In the, I, uh, this map is actually included, talking about how Buddhism spread throughout Asia. Today is just on Central Asia. So I hope that this talk was interesting to you. This is actually the fortress of Tia Yiguan, or the Jade Gate in Gobi Desert. This was built by the Ming Dynasty, right? We were there, and it was also taken by a phone, <laughs> right? And, uh, but there was another one that was during the Han Dynasty. That one we didn't go. That was the, almost the original uh, fortress uh, linked up with the Great Wall. You see, the reason why this fortress was done, this was the final extent. This is almost the boundary of the Chinese territory. And uh, uh, on both sides are mountains and deserts. So there's only a normal uh, kind of passage if you're a... Uh, uh, if you want to attack China, this is the only way you can go. So this is where they built the gate in order to control and because they can protect uh, the rest of China by positioning themselves. So this was built during the Ming, uh, Ming Dynasty, Jade Gate, and Jade also traveled through this area from Khotan and all traveled through this area, brought back to China. All right, so this is the talk. I hope you find this talk really interesting. Yeah. yeah.